Welcome to 3 PNR. I'm your host, Adam R. And joining me today is Kenneth Dudley. Kenneth, how are you doing, sir? Oh, we're doing fine. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Kenneth. I'm glad to have you on. Uh, Kenneth is coming in via phone call, so if the audio is a little weird, yeah, you know why. Uh, Kenneth, let's talk about ufology. and, and so, I mean, you're an experiencer. Um, you're also a researcher, so let's, let's get into what put you there. Okay, uh, well, uh, about 14 years ago, uh, I started to uh, get involved in the UFO world. Uh, up until then, I really didn't follow it. I didn't read any UFO magazines or books or really, you know, pay that much attention to it. But, uh, you know, I was almost killed in a car wreck in 2005 on the Galveston Seawall here in the Houston metropolitan area and uh, probably should have uh, been killed in the car wreck, but I was man. I managed to survive. Anyway, um, I hired uh, the Texas Hammer, which is one of those UFO, not UFO, one of those uh, lawyers that would come on TV and uh, and uh, represent people that've been severely injured in car wrecks. And uh, I had to have my knee operated on. Uh, my kneecap was shattered, so. Uh, it took me about two years to rehab after the accident. And in the process, my lawyer couldn't find this lady that ran the red light uh, and hit me and almost killed me. Uh, so I was upset with my lawyer, and I went into his office one day and uh, asked him if he had any information on this woman. And he gave me a stack of uh, papers that were someone had done a computer printout of every possible location she might be. Uh, people she might know, phone numbers, et cetera. And uh, I took that home and got on an old beat-up computer and with my cell phone and uh, started thumbing through this 400-page uh, report and started calling phone numbers in there. And about four hours later, I got her daughter on the phone, and uh, I said, I'm an old friend from high school. And I'd like to uh, contact your mother. And she said, well, she's in a Buddhist temple on top of a mountain in Crestone, Colorado. So I turned that information over to my lawyer. And in the process of researching uh, Crestone and San Luis Valley in Colorado, it came up that that was a UFO hotspot. Uh, one out of every six people in a six-county area, claims to have seen a UFO at some time in their life. So that kind of got my interest going because back uh, in October 1973, I was living on the West Coast uh, with my girlfriend, and we were traveling back uh, to Missouri to visit relatives on I-70, and we were coming through the mountains of Utah. It was a two-lane highway at that time, Interstate 70. And I had to stop her car about 20 miles west of Green River, Utah, uh, to let a flying saucer take off, which was hovering right in front of us, right on Interstate 70 block in the highway. And uh, basically, uh, I was scared to death. Um, and what what and year is I, this, Kenneth, that this is happening? Uh, uh, this was October 1973. And uh, so because of uh, I almost killed this car wreck, I decided to uh, uh, make an, a report, uh, you know, after 38 years. And uh, I contacted the National UFO Reporting Center and made a report online with them. You can report UFO sightings online with them. And the head guy got back with me about 30 days later and was really nasty to me. And uh, I thought to myself, well, the guy runs a UFO reporting center. He wants people to make reports. But at the same time, I made a report after I was almost killed in a car accident about something that happened 38 years earlier. And so it kind of upset me because he was coming at me as a liar. And please don't make any more reports to my UFO reporting center. So anyway, I was upset. Uh, I had to find someone else to uh, 
make an official report to. I didn't know who to make a report to. Uh, I found MUFON. I had never even heard of MUFON. And uh, they assigned me the Utah investigator, Dean Foley, who works for the state of Utah, was their investigator up in Utah. So because my sighting was in Utah, um, they put me with him. And uh, he called me over the phone like we're talking now and asked me a bunch of questions. We talked many times. And one specific time later on, I asked him, you know, Dean, I'm a truck driver. I've been in every state, every major city, along every highway. And I said, I have never seen anything strange that I couldn't put my finger on or figure out. And I said, but this one particular time, I was heading back home from California with my girlfriend. And we had to stop our car in the middle of the highway to let a giant flying saucer take off. I said, that doesn't make any sense to me. Up there, it's 150 miles uh, of nothing but trees and mountains and mountain valleys. And the only thing that I saw was these deer that jumped out in front of me, about six of them, about a mile before uh, we came in contact with the, the UFO, the flying saucer. And... Uh, that's the only thing I saw except for the flying saucer. Anyway, so uh, we got in, uh, we stood in the highway, uh, Lindsay, my old girlfriend who I'm still in contact with after all these years, and uh, watched this thing take off. And we were so close to this thing that, first of all, I was in a state of shock. Um, I was in shock during my car accident, and I was in shock at this particular time. And I just stood there, just unbelievable. It was just mind-boggling. You're just frozen. But I was close enough to the ship to get an electrical charge off the ship. It was putting out some sort of glowing aurora, red aurora around the ship. Uh, and you could perfectly see the, the saucer in the dome. The dome was going counterclockwise, and the saucer was rotating, rotating clockwise. Because as we came off this mountain, we had a bird's eye view of it, and it looked like we were going to intersect at the bottom of the mountain in a gorge, because uh, there was a gorge, there was a river that ran right below the mountain, and you have to go into the gorge, back up out of the gorge, and level out into the mountain valley, and it was in the gorge. And, and when I first noticed it to my left, uh, it was moving, I felt like about the same speed I was moving. And I was scared we were going to intersect at the bottom of the mountain. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Except I wasn't going to go any farther. I stopped the car because I was scared, like the deer were scared. And uh, we watched it take off. And then so we got in our car and proceeded on to Denver. It's about a five-hour drive or so from Green River to Denver. And uh, the whole trip for five hours uh, – I just was driving, and my girlfriend was riding, and I think we didn't hardly say two words. I think the only thing she said to me was, did you see that? And I said, yeah, yeah, I saw it. <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short on that particular thing is a few years later, we uh, broke up, and she went her way, and I went my way. And uh, I led a normal life. I was a truck driver. I worked for J.B. Hunt Transport, the big yellow trucks that you see driving up and down the highway. 16 years, I was a driver, a uh, city dispatch driver, uh, dispatcher. I went into the office, became a fleet manager, and then r ran city dispatch for J.B. Hunt in Houston, Texas. We had about 500 drivers running out of our terminal, terminal there in Houston. And anyway, so I didn't really think all that much about it. As the years went by, I told, you know, my parents and relatives and stuff like that. And, you know, they said, well, okay. They didn't know what to think. Uh, of course, most people never see a UFO. It's very rare to see one. Um, but like I said, the people in the San Luis Valley, uh, when I was doing some research, one out of every six people in a six-county area claims have seen a UFO up there. So anyway, so I got sparked my interest, and I made a report to the National UFO Reporting Center in 2008 after my car accident. 
and didn't like the results I got from them. So I hooked up with MUFON and uh, was talking to Dean. And I said, Dean, I'm a truck driver. Uh, never seen anything uh, unusual. And uh, he said, well, oh, by the way, our top missile base, the Utah Launch Complex, was just as a crow flies about 20 miles to your east of your location right there. And I said, oh, okay, well, maybe the UFO was there because of military base. So, I mean, it's uh, not impossible. If you, you know, from all I'm learning, um, we're definitely being observed. We're, we're definitely being studied. And they seem to have a, a keen interest in our nuclear facilities, whether it be weaponized or, or just power related. Uh, in, in Utah, like you said, you have vastness of nothing for as far as the eye could see. So it would be a great place for them to set up for studies. Well, I, I um, after I did my uh, uh, deal with MUFON, uh, MUFON Dean contacted the headquarters of MUFON and made an official report with them because it was a sighting at a military base, which he felt was absolutely critical and made a report to MUFON headquarters. And uh, I got back with Dean and he said, yeah, headquarters is really excited because you had a sighting at a military base. And uh, one thing led to another, and then all of a sudden, bam, complete silence, not a word, nobody called, nothing happened. So in 2008, I said, um, I can't depend on the National UFO Reporting Center I can't depend on MUFON. I'm going to start my own investigation. And that's when I started investigating in 2008. And I've been doing it for 14 straight years. And I'm on LinkedIn as a UFO investigator at this point. When you saw that craft, you were just uh, so I'm coming to believe that the uh, the glow that you've seen around most UFOs are, you know, whatever technology they're using to manipulate space time is ionizing the air around it. Um, did it, when it went in a certain direction, did it, was it the belly facing the direction it went in? No. Uh, when I was standing there, like I said, it was putting out a red glow around Aurora, around the, the black saucer, black dome and black saucer part of the ship. And I, that's the only thing I could see, but it was putting out some sort of electrical charge, which was causing all my hair on my body to basically stand up and just start tingling, just tingling. And I, and I don't know if it was because I was so scared and I've been in a lot of scary situations, but that was the most, or if I was actually close enough, so I was probably a hundred feet from this thing. And this was gigantic. It was 200 feet long and a hundred feet high. <laughs> I was dwarfed by this thing and it was right in front of me and I was scared to death. But my whole, I was tingling. My whole body was tingling, all the hair on me. So it was putting out some sort of electrical charge. And when it took off, it went straight up and became a star in seconds. And just blew my mind. I was just in total shock. And it flew away. I'm starting to get under star. the impression, from everything I've learned, the impression I'm being given now is uh, when they're stationary, the, the it glows at a, probably like a, a, you know, a lesser rate, well, probably a solid color as you saw, right? Cause it's not utilized. Yeah, it was a solid energy. color. It never pulsed out. It never had a pulse to it or anything, but I feel like it was part of the uh, propulsion system, propulsion system that the, the glow was as it was powering up to take off. And, and that's what I feel. I feel like the red glow, uh, it had something to do with its system as it was powering up to take off and it just went straight up. I mean, it didn't turn on its side or, or anything. And it just, and all of a sudden you're looking up and you see this star flying away. Yeah. It's as like as it's star. like, um, it's entering. So in other words, when it powers up, it ionizes the air around it. Cause it's using, you know, a, a, a strong electricity magnetics and probably a frequency is what I'm starting to think, too, because when you're manipulating space time, which we don't do here on Earth, clearly we, we use jet fuel, etc. Um, I'm under the impression when you see them pulsating in the air, it's because they're, they're using more power for that particular moment when they're moving around. Um, and in your case, that's a fairly large craft. So, yeah, and I was very close to it. 
Um, I didn't see any aliens. I didn't see anything but the ship. But I was so close to the ship that it was scary. It was very, very scary. It's the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. Now, the chances of me ever seeing another one again are probably about win- like winning the lotto. Right. It's very rare. It's very hard. But I just happened to be passing a military base. So as I did my research and my investigation, I found out first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to get hold of my girlfriend. So I called my girlfriend. She's an artist in San Diego and uh, called her up, Lindsay, Lindsay Duff. And I called her up and said, this is Kit. (laughs) Well, Lindsay said she didn't ask me if I was married, where I was living, if I had any kids or anything. The first thing out of that woman's mouth after 38 years was, do you remember the UFO? <laughs> and yeah, I, said, I mean, yeah. it's got it, yeah, yeah, to have I, a profound effect. I remember effect. the UFO, okay, Lindsay, no problem. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, you're talking about a profound effect on somebody, right? Yeah, like, it's like, uh, I would say that uh, if you saw an angel, <laughs> I've never seen an angel, but if you saw an angel or you saw something that was just totally mind-blowing, it's almost like a godlike experience in some ways. It's right. just mind blowing. It's just, uh, you know. So anyway, um, so after I got hold of her, because I wanted her to confirm after 38 years that, yeah, we're still thinking about this. This really happened. And so then I said, you know, I need to go in and start my own investigation. So I'm going to work in the area of military intelligence. And the reason why I picked military intelligence was because my sighting was at a military base. So I'm trying to put together the interaction of the UFOs and our military. And what's going on with this interaction between these UFOs and our military at our military bases? Well, so in 2010, uh, there was a uh, UFO conference at the press club in Washington, D.C., down the street from the White House. They've got their big press club down there. And a guy named Robert Solis, who was in the Air Force, uh, in a missile silo, commander of a missile silo, up in uh, Malmstrom Air Force Base, up in uh, the north there somewhere. I'm not exactly sure Montana where it's at or whatever, uh, was putting on a conference there. And so um, I watched the conference, and uh, in the conference, he had like six or seven ex-military officers testify in the press club before the press that they were all at these missile bases and all at these nuke bases and some weird UFOs showed up and they didn't know what was going on and they made reports and no one did anything about it. And it was hush, hush, hush. So I said, well, you know what? My sighting was at a military base. So I need to hook up with Robert Salas. So I went to Roswell, New Mexico in 2011 and hooked up with Robert Salas because my interest is in the military intelligence area and interaction of UFOs in our military. So um, I hooked up with Robert. I went in. He was in the museum there, the Roswell Museum. Uh, They have a festival every year up there, and they have UFO speakers come uh, to Roswell. So this was my first trip to Roswell in 2011, and I sat down next to Robert Salas, and I started talking to Robert and telling him about my sighting at a military base, and I was interested in his sighting, and made several questions of him, and one of my questions was he had written a book, and uh, on the cover front cover of the book uh, was a missile silo with a red UFO hovering over the missile silo. So my first question to Robert, who's a ex-military guy, was uh, this color, this color about this UFO, it's exactly the same color is what this UFO I saw and at another military base. And he said, yeah, the, my guards, my top, see, he was in the silo. They had top security guards on the top. And he says, this is what the security guards called down to me in the missile silo. 
and he says they were their voices were shaking. He says they were very scared. He said one guy flipped out and tried to cl- climb over a barbed wire fence, got all cut up, and they had to haul him off. And I said, well, what happened to your guards, security guards? He says, the Office of Special Investigation, Air Force, came and took all the guards away. And we never saw them ever again. Uh, they were just gone. We don't know where they took the guards to. But I said, okay. And then I said, um, uh, Robert told me some more stuff. And so that's when my whole thing started to really get intense was in 2011 after meeting Robert Salas because he said that these UFOs turned off their nuclear weapons, just turned them off, and they just went off. You know, to support that, uh, Mike Gallagher, in one of the the, the more recent um, uh, congressional hearings, uh, they were they were taking note of red orbs or, or red lights in and around you know, nuclear facilities and military facilities. Um, it's one of the questions they asked in Aaron, if you heard in that congressional hearing, when he did ask about it, uh, immediately said, well, that's something we'll cover in a closed session. Right. Well, what you're hearing now is what they're probably hearing in the closed session. Okay. Right. But when, uh, as of right now, I'm in communication with, uh, Senator Rubio from Florida. And he is on the Senate Intelligence Committee. He's the second highest ranking uh, senator on that committee. There's the Democrats have the highest ranking uh, senator on that committee. And all the Democrats and all the Republicans on the Senate Intelligence Committee are all asking these questions of the Air Force and the FBI and the CIA and all these people about what they know about this uh, UAP. They call them UAPs now instead of UFOs. But um, of what's going on. <laughs> the problem is the, the, um, the military-industrial complex has left the Senate, the Congress, the American people out of the loop on what's going on on this UFO thing. Even the president doesn't really know exactly what's going on here because the CIA has headed the cover-up of this UFO issue since the 1940s. Truman turned over the UFO problem to the Central Intelligence Agency. And the Central Intelligence Agency tells the Air Force what to say, the Army what to say, and the Navy what to say. And so uh, the information just never got out. This has been going on for 77 years, this cover-up, since the 1940s. And, uh, and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to educate the Congress, educate the Senate, educate the Intelligence Committee. And but I'm having to go up against Air Force, the Army, the Navy, the FBI, and the CIA because this is top secret stuff here. And the president's not supposed to know, the Senate's not supposed to know, and no regular people are supposed to know what's going on here. And it's because way back when they had the uh, the radio show where they said. Uh, uh, you know, the aliens are invading or whatever. Oh, on the, yeah, over the, the radio. people went into panic. They went into panic. And then in the 60s, um, there was a, um, someone did a, uh, some sort of a report on this. And what the report was about was that, yes, this is exactly what's going to happen if you tell the people. And so we must cover this up at all costs. And, Make a joke of it. Yeah. So, so, that the so Kenneth, there's a, this is a joke. There's a, okay. there's a couple of parts to that, Kenneth. There's a couple of moving parts to this. Uh, one, as far as a military complex, uh, we, in 1961, Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, warned us about the, the uprising and the power of the, the industrial mi- military complex. We know this. Um, two, UFOs, by no doubt, they're real. 
We now know because military release videos and we're cutting, we're evolving a little more with the information. They're real, no question. But at the same note, I, I, I say this a lot. The benefit to UFOs for the military and the government is it's a great smokescreen. So when they want to test out new things, whether it be here or ab- abroad, it's it's the scapegoat. It could have been the UFO because it's unknown. And and what country is willing to argue with us? Like, for instance, if we send something over to China to test out our ability to, to spy and we could claim it as a UFO, and are they going to argue that? Do they really want an open forum where they're going to argue against the idea of a UFO? Because remember, the word UFO has got a stigma attached to it, which is why our, our current government's using UAP. Because they don't want that, they don't want to use the language that had a previous stigma. Right, attached they don't to it. want to use the old language because there's a stigma to it, and they and the military industrial complex created this whole thing. They made it. They they have infiltrated uh, MUFON, and a lot of people don't know this, but MUFON has been infiltrated by people that make reports to the military industrial complex. Well, sure. That's and, our government will always make sure someone's in place so they know first. I mean, it, you're talking about or for, first of all, Muf, Mufon is a great organization. They have great people. I've spoken to a lot of them, but it's impossible to not have um, a mole get in to anything. It's nearly impossible. I mean, we saw examples of that with our U.S. government and Russian spies over the course of time. Like they they get in, they get upon us, um, and. It's not just for misinformation, but it's so they can have a heads up. Because a lot of people that experience UFOs or, or have contact or are abducted, uh, they, they fear ridicule. They, they fear the, the being attached to the stigma. Plus, they don't really trust the government to make their claim and report to a government official. So rather, they would speak to MUFON uh, or well, other organizations. I don't, I don't know anybody that's in the UFO world that trusts the government. Not one single. Well, it's hard to be. I'll tell you why. A lot of people ask me, well, you think, well, you think the president knows? Well, there's no way the president knows. His term is between four and eight years. So he doesn't have the classified classification to know that information. However, there's some generals that have been generals since, you know, the decades. Those are the people that know people that have been in service for decades and they don't play in front of cameras. There's no political agenda. They almost don't fly a flag because their their interest is not in like Republican Democrat. Their interest is in, well, maybe for the better of the country. But when it comes to intel, you have to be a non biased party because you're moving forward through decades and you can't fly the flag of a president or a group in that in that position. It's not possible. Well, you know, as I interview these, so so I work with military people, NASA people, police people, police officers people like that, Homeland Security people, all that, because what ended up happening was I had to go on my own, okay? So after I got done with MUFON and decided MUFON, now here's a little funny thing about MUFON. I was talking to the the president of MUFON, the one that just got busted (laughs) for child pornography or whatever. Yeah, I Uh, heard about it. Yeah. Anyway, I was I was talking to him on the phone and I said, you know, this is a national security issue. This is why they don't want to tell the people. And they, this is the president of Munifon. Yeah, you're exactly 100 percent right. It's a national security issue. And that's why they don't want to tell anybody. That's the president of Munifon said that. Anyway, so I said, you know, I don't understand why you all don't really go hog wild crazy and push this thing all the way to the top because you have a hundred thousand UFO reports from a hundred thousand people and you're supposed to represent these people and you're supposed to help these people and all these people are reporting to you and you don't do anything about it except take a report. You know, it's tough. I'll say this much in any organization uh, even local ones, even even in social environments like your group of like, let's say you, Kenneth, you have a group of friends. You're good friends with all of them. Uh, some of your close friends have turmoil with one another when it comes to agreeing, agreeing with things. So you being the head of your your social group of friends, it puts you in a position where you know what I mean. You want to be safe for both parties to kind of find the middle ground. And unfortunately, when it gets to that point, 
information could get lost. So I agree with what you're saying. You, there has to be the person at the top who's non-biased, has no friends in the group, and is going gonna, is gonna to examine and report exactly what, what he was uh, put before him. You know, get to the details. It's a scary business it, in ufology. Uh, yeah, well, you, you got to remember that the military-industrial complex, they're in the processing, and they've already done it in my book, are in the process of trying to reverse alien technology, and they've been trying to do this since the 40s. Right. And I got- mean, any military pe- person, if you could get some technology that no one else had, you would be, you know, in control, <laughs> in control of the world because well, you have some technology that no one else has. Do you know, you ever notice that when recently China, and I, I was talking about their hypersonic missiles and, and America didn't rebuttal. We had no response to that. And that tells me, not that we're in fear of these hypersonic missiles, but in our minds, we're like, well, we got something better. We're just not going to talk about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, um, <laughs> yeah, I heard a general one time say that uh, uh, they, someone asked him about the Chinese, and uh, he said, well, the Chinese, we got things 10 times more powerful and 10 times more high tech than they've got. Indeed. Ten I mean, times. Our, our, I mean, <laughs> our stealth program was in the sixties, starting in the sixties, fifties and sixties. I mean, that was, that was our stealth program. Imagine what we have back, back toward right now. Crazy. So if you could, if you could get a crashed UFO and you could work on reversing that technology for 77 years, you might have something there. And I'm sure that's what they've been up to, why they've kept it super under control. Yeah, and that's because UFO people since the very beginning, they've not only been, um, uh, you know, joked about, but they've been threatened. They've lost their jobs. Yeah. They've been ruined. Some people commit uh, suicide. Somebody has been subverting the whole system and threatening American citizens. I've got a, a witness up here at uh, North Texas up here that was at, uh, we had a big UFO flap up here, Stephenville, Texas. And uh, I went up there to do an investigation on what happened up there. And uh, I talked to the rancher, uh, Texas rancher that had the closest viewpoint of the uh, the UFO it had gone right over his property at uh, very low and he had gotten a really good view of it. And so the, he's the guy that I wanted to talk to more than anything else. Cause he was the best witness. Uh, even though the whole town saw it <laughs> 20,000 people, whatever it was. And uh, he said that, yes, uh, it had flown right over his house. And then all of a sudden, there was a bunch of jets in the air, and the jets were chasing the UFO. And um, I got a whole lot more information than that on what happened up there. But the bottom line is, because he was the number one witness to this event, all of a sudden, there was a phone call on his phone. And he was told, we've got guns, and we will use them on you if you don't keep your mouth shut about what you saw. And his answer to whoever the person was on the phone, cross the cattle guard and you're dead. (laughs) Yeah. And not only that, but a black helicopter appeared above his house that night, hovering just off the top of his roof of his house. You know, and he came out of his house and put a spotlight right on the, right on the black helicopter and it pulled off his top of his house and left. I, so he was threatened because he saw a UFO. So somebody's threatening witnesses and I'm going to get them. It's, I don't I, care I imagine, if the military, I'm going to nail them. So I imagine, uh, and I'll tell you a couple of things. Uh, one, the black helicopters. I used to think that was nonsense. I thought people were making that up. And then I started no, seeing No, unmarked videos. black helicopters. Yeah, yeah. It's a special unit. Special right. military unit. And I think they're CIA operating operation. Well, I've been seeing some videos of them now. 
And when you see one, you're still like, eh, that might be nonsense. But when you see like five or ten and it's a similar black unmarked helicopter, you know, anything in the air has to have a tail number or lights or or be appropriately colored so it can be viewed by other craft. So there's Unless no you're a CIA right. operation. Right. And black so, ops. And back to uh, have we been retro engineering U- UFOs? More than likely. And you got to understand our science, our technology, our, our comprehension of technology in the 40s versus today is significantly different. And even what we think we understand today still isn't as good as in comparison to what the technology we have in storage. So like Bob Lazar said, we got to keep putting the projects on the shelf till we catch up with our, our science and our technology. Because otherwise, we have a roundabout idea how they work. But to retro-engineer it, we, our ability to retro-engineer we have to get to that still. And I think we're working. And right. I think that's part of the cover up. Why did well, they keep I went, UFO to, I went to cover Bob Lazar. I went to the international UFO conference in Phoenix where they have uh, uh, the big UF, international UFO conference every year. And Bob Lazar was going to be there. And so I went to watch and hear what Bob Lazar had to say. So I was at the conference. I was sitting on the front row when he was uh, questioned by uh, that, uh, press guy uh, that interviewed him, the one that broke the story, the famous UFO. George Knapp. George Knapp. George Knapp was questioning him. I was on the front row. There was a thousand people in the auditorium. And I was sitting on the front row because I really wanted to hear what Bob Lazar said. And uh, all of a sudden, this is really weird. All of a sudden, this guy comes in uh, with a dolly. And in military type fatigues and boots and hat and jacket and wearing sunglasses, pulling a duffel bag on this uh, dolly. Hmm. And he sits down right next to me. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, where'd this guy come from? I'm looking at the crowd. The crowd looked like just regular people. Okay, (laughs) just regular people. They didn't look like they just came from a military base or something like that. Okay. And I was watching him, and all of a sudden he knew, because I was sitting right next to him, he looked in my eyes, and I looked in his eyes, and he knew that I was watching him. Well, so the guy gets up when Bob Lazar uh, is talking and walks right in front of Knapp and Bob, just right in front of the stage and starts clicking all these pictures hmm. from, a, from a camera. And then he comes back in, and he sits down, and he puts his camera into his duffel bag. God only knows what he had in there. <laughs> yeah, you but know, anyway. real quick, a couple things. One, our government trains agents to go to other countries with different spe- uh, language, different pat- speech, different uh, ethnic background. We're made to blend in in other countries. Imagine how easy it is to blend in at a UFO conference. Well, I knew something was wrong with this guy. Because the room was dark, and he was wearing a pair of sunglasses, and I don't ever see anybody wear sunglasses in a dark room. Right, Oh, Obano <laughs> from YouTube. So right. he gave his he gave himself away to me as some kind of uh, he, he was there because of uh, Bob Lazar. So here's the funny thing: as soon as Bob's done talking, this guy splits. So I follow him, and he's hauling ass as fast as he can with this duffel bag on this dolly out to a car and is leaving. He was only there to, to make a report on Bob Lazar and take pictures of Bob Lazar. And he wasn't a newsman. He was more like a some type of military intelligence type. Dude. Right. You know, this isn't the and, first time and, I've heard this, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I got the picture. I, I took a picture of his license plate. I followed <laughs> him to his car and took a picture of his license plate. <laughs> anyway, um, that's a you're uh, you're, John a, you're Alexander. On <laughs> John, you have ever heard of John Alexander? No, I haven't. John Alexander, uh, Colonel John Alexander. It doesn't ring a bell to me. That maybe it's something I should know, but it doesn't ring a bell. Okay, for me. Colonel John Alexander was uh, in the Marines, and he came out of the Marines, and he was interested in UFOs. So he's been following the UFO people for the last 30 or 40 years. He's written several UFO books and he 
considers himself a military expert on UFOs, and he's a military guy. Okay, so, <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, do you have when contact I told with him? him? Huh? Do you have contact with him? Oh yeah, I've, I've got his phone number. I talk to him. I meet him. I made a report to John. Yeah, I would be. I would be interested in talking Utah. to him. I would like to talk to him if you could set that up. Anyway, I, I gave the same report to him about the UFO up there in Utah. And he wrote down every single thing I said for an hour. And the, my problem was I was talking too much. And I wasn't listening to what he had to say as he questioned me. So he was questioning me. I should have been questioning him. But anyway, John Alexander is involved in the men that stare at goats. Have you ever heard the, the show? I, I I did, and I thought that too was fiction, and found out it was uh, something no, experimental. It's not yeah, <laughs> they, the I, military actually has a special unit of guys that work on psychic different stuff. Right. Okay. Right. Power projection so was, is what it is. So he's he's questioning me, and this is at the U- international UFO conference outside at a table because I dragged his ass out. He was one of the main dudes in there, and I I just showed him my name. And he only knew who I was. And I said, John, I need to talk to you. So he came out. And we sat there. And I could have sworn that as I was talking and not listening, when I said October 1973, I was on the highway up there and I came into a UFO and it was interacting with our military base, I almost could have said that he said, and that's when we went underground. Hmm. Completely totally underground October 1973 because of this UFO wave, which was the last great UFO wave. It happened in October 1973 and it was a worldwide wave all over the world. Now the question is what was going on on October 1973? Well, guess what? There was a war that broke out in uh, the middle East. And it was Yom Kippur. Matter of fact, we're right on the anniversary. Yom Kippur. Hmm. It was like a six-day war uh, between the Israelis and the Arabs. And the Russians were on the Arab side, and we were on the Jewish side. Okay? And so this war was raging exactly at the same time over in the Middle East. And because the Russians were involved, our nuclear de- uh, defenses were raised. We have what they call DEFCON. DEFCON 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 5 is nothing. 4 is uh, stand by. 3 is get ready. 2 is get ready to launch. And 1 is launch. Okay. And we were at 3. And that's the last time we've been at DEFCON 3 was October 1973 during this war in the Middle East. And that's why the ship was in the gorge monitoring the missile base because there was a there was a, almost an exchange of nuclear weapons going to happen between Russia and the United States. Now, what's weird about the whole deal is we've come full cycle. We're right back now. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask Russia you, by the way. threatening I... to use nuclear weapons. Right. We're just about ready to go right back to DEFCON 3. And it wouldn't surprise me if we have another UFO wave. They call them waves when all of a sudden everybody starts calling in the FBI saying, I saw a UFO. <laughs> and well, matter of fact, they all did in October 1973. And the director of the FBI had to make an official statement to the public that the FBI does not investigate UFOs, but we would like to help, but we can't. Right. And that was the letter. So the here's what I'm getting so far. FBI. So uh, uh, let me touch Bob Lazar and then I'll touch that. So Bob Lazar, many years ago, decades ago, I, I watched some of his older interviews. Everything that man, and it surprises me that the congressional hearing didn't involve him. Because, and, and I say this because that man, decades ago, described an uh, uh, element that was considered fiction. They called him bullshit. And then here it is, we have it now. It's on the periodical table. He said back then, the UFOs, and he described how they maneuver, what the, and, you know, the mechanics behind it, 
We now see examples of that in the military videos. It goes belly first at it when it's getting ready to, you know, meet its trajectory. He everything Bob described how these things operate, uh, the elements involved. Now we know to be, you know, scientific fact or, or investigative fact. And he was also saying that Area 51 is where they do the reversing of the right. alien technology. And we didn't even publicly, even though we knew more about it in the 90s, it wasn't publicly acknowledged till President Ob- Barack Obama. It, pri- prior to pr- President Obama, no other president acknowledged it other than the inquiries of Bill Clinton. And even Bill Clinton himself, when he went to find information about UFOs in Area 51, they basically said he didn't have the clearance. Yeah. And if he did, if he did, I wouldn't trust Bill Clinton an inch because I'll tell you why he could very well know something and then lie that he doesn't know anything because he said, I did not have sex with that woman. Right. Well, guess what? I can prove that he had was involved in that sex ring up there in New York. Uh, yeah. That they just put the girl in prison. The guy hung himself. The other guy over in France hung himself. And they said all these important people were involved in it. Well, Bill Clinton was one of them, and I got pictures of it. So I'll tell you what, as far as Bill Clinton goes, he's a liar. I wouldn't trust a guy an inch. Perhaps he is, but outside of that, outside of his personal stuff, outside of the, the controversy surrounding him, he did make an inquiry about UFOs, and they shut him down. Yeah, that's because that's because he was under a lot of pressure from people to make some sort of a statement, just like the FBI director back in October 1973 was under intense pressure to make some sort of an official FBI statement on the issue from the October 1973 UFO wave. And that's what's going on right now. I am personally putting pressure on the FBI, Homeland Security, the Air Force. And a whole lot of other. Well, people. What kind of pushback are you getting from them? Are they are they are they being abrasive with well, you? I've, in been any way? To, I've been to the FBI here in Houston because what happened was once Mufon wasn't going to do anything, I felt because this is a national security issue, I had to make an official report to the FBI. Okay. So I went to FBI headquarters right here in Houston. We got the fourth largest in the United States. And I went in there. And I sat down three different times now with the FBI agents, duty agents. They won't give their, they don't give you their names. Okay. It's not like Fox and Mulder or something like that. You go in there and you get assigned a duty agent. They put you in these little rooms and they ask you a bunch of questions and they probably tape record everything you say. And, uh, but you'll never get their name. But anyway, the first time in to the FBI over this issue, I produced that letter from the director of the FBI because uh, the agent, I got an agent, he was a guy, and, uh, you know, he was playing along with me, and I was trying to explain things to me, and he was kind of half-ass paying attention. And then I, and then when he told me, well, you know, the FBI, we really don't handle stuff like that, uh, I, I handed them the letter from the director from October 1973, and all of a sudden, he shut up <laughs> very quickly, shut up. And then he says, the interview is now over. <laughs> you know, let me, let me, Kenneth, let me tell you something, Kenneth. So I, I have a guy coming on uh, next week. He investigated OJ Simpson, right? His name's Norman. Uh, I personally went to look at some of the records from OJ because there's a lot of weird shit surrounding OJ, that case. Now, Imagine people trying to get po- the to get a Freedom of Information Act for ufology, something that's really up there where our government would be concerned. Versus OJ, when you go look at OJ's case, there's everything sealed. There's a lot of redacted files, and that's just OJ. Now try to imagine getting the information needed on a, something re- related to UFOs. All UFO stuff is heavily redacted, heavily redacted. And the only reason why it would be heavily redacted if they didn't want you to read what was on the piece of paper. Okay? Right. A lot of that is pride. Uh, so our government, as well as a smokescreen, as well as, um, you know, things like organized religion and, and you know, the religion, because let's face it, religion's a, a, a powerful entity on this planet, right? And it's, it's against their better interest to acknowledge life elsewhere. But again, forget all of that, right? Imagine the pride of a of a, a superpower telling its nation, "Well, there's something out there, and if it were to attack, 
we would be powerless. Uh, they couldn't. They couldn't tell the public that. Right. Exactly. So that's part of, in my opinion, not again, not just a smokescreen, not just because they're retro engineering, but that in itself says it, it conveys a message that yet are here and there's nothing we can do about it. And, right. And at the end so, of the day, we're, 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 listen, the, the general public has not had exposure to uh, uh, an, an alien being. They're not here publicly. We're not having meet and greets. Clearly, we're a study. Clearly, they're they're observing us, and clearly, it's for been, thousands. We of years. have been watched, and and now I want to say a little thing about history here. Sure, I work with a lot of Native Americans, and the Native Americans have told me that way back before the white man ever came to this country, the Indians already knew about flying saucers. Yeah, they because described, they were they, interact, they were seeing them way back when the Native Americans were the only ones here. Yeah, they were described as sky gods that would travel in fiery in fiery objects. The, the Cherokee Indians, along with the Paiutes, and I don't know how many other tribes, actually believe that they are the children of star beings. It's not impossible. Listen, here, you want to hear something funny, Kenneth? Everything we send to space, every probe, every satellite, everything even though it's in a sterile field when being constructed before, you know, because we don't want to contaminate, even then, bacteria is going to get on. It's impossible to keep something completely sterile. I've just had this conversation. It, well, it's mathematically impossible to be the only living creatures like beings sure. in the universe. They've already done the mathematics on it. It's impossible. We can't be the only people here. It's not just okay. impossible. It's nonsensical. There's definitely life out in the universe. Not to mention you know, how many galaxies we're, we're locating. How many now we're under the theory that there might be multiple universes in a bubble. So life out there is not. It's not just that's impossible. It's nonsensical to think it isn't there. And hypothetically speaking, now we're going to send a probe to a to a moon over by by uh, Saturn and another moon over in Jupiter that we believe to have oceans on it. And if there's ocean and it's water-based, there's some form of oxygen there one way or the other. We know these moons are heated from their core due to friction from their planet and other moons. Now, we set a probe there, and bacteria from Earth is attached. You give it a few million years, the evolution, uh, as evolution would prevail, how do we know we don't start another life on another planet unknowingly? How do we know our life here didn't start from our observers? That when they came here, they found a planet. It's got, it's got rocks. It's got water. There's really no life there, but it's got the potential. How do we know their bacteria didn't get on our planet? How do we know we didn't evolve from an alien species? Unknowingly. Well, the government, from what I pick up, what the what I'm picking up is the government thinks that there is alien DNA in humans, and they're very interested in that. And so, anyway, so let's go back to the FBI. So the second time into the FBI, it was over the. UFO nuke press conference. I posted that on your Facebook wall. I saw it. Okay. You can watch it if you want to. And it's where all these uh, military officers testify before the press club about UFO incursions at their military bases. But anyway, uh, the second time in, it was over the UFO nuke press conference because I got the affidavits, the affidavits of all the officers. I got them. So I went into the FBI and I walked in there and I said, Houston, we've got a problem. And I was talking to the FBI now. Okay. <laughs> and I sat down there and this time I wanted a woman agent instead of a man agent. So they sent me a woman agent. She sat there and wrote every single thing I said down for two straight hours wow. as I produced the affidavit from all the military officers. And let me tell you, people say, oh, the FBI doesn't care about that. Well, have you been to the FBI? Have you taken evidence, testimony, affidavits to the FBI and asked them what they think? But anyway, uh, so they said, oh, they didn't care. Well, I said, if they didn't care, they would have kicked my ass out of there and not wrote down everything I said for two hours, okay? Hmm. So that was the second time in there. The third time I came in there, I came in with a a disc because I had called up the FBI headquarters and I said, I've got a, I've got a, on a disc, some top secret stuff 
that I want to turn over to the FBI. And I, and, and I was talking to a woman agent and uh, she told me, well, come on down here make sure you got it on the disc, come in here and turn the disc over. So that's exactly what I did. And all of a sudden, when I got in there, I got another woman duty agent. And I said, I was talking to another FBI agent and they told me to bring this disc down here and turn it in. All of a sudden, she didn't want to handle it. Hmm. And she said, but I will give you the information where to send this information to in Washington. He says, here in Houston, we don't handle UFOs. UFOs are only handled out of Washington FBI. Hmm. I wonder why that is. Uh, well, Houston basically handles uh, cyber, cyber security for the FBI, right? And and different border security things and different things. They don't specialize. I've got more expertise in UFOs and aliens than anybody in the FBI. Almost. Period. Let There's me ask you a, a question. handful of people in the FBI that know what I know. Okay, and they don't say nothing. Let me ask you a question, Kenneth. Out of all the agencies and, and military branches you, you reach out to, who, and I do this in a rule-out phase, it'll kind of tell me who would be in the know. Which agency or, or a branch of military has given you the most resistance in, in, as far as you speaking with them or, or, or uh, getting gaining information? Well, it would be the Air Force. Okay. Because I went to Ellington Air Force Base south of Houston over here. And I was trying to hook up with the Office of Special Investigation. And I pulled up to the guard shack, and they, the guard asked me what I was there for at the Air Force Base. And I said, well, I was doing an investigation, and I've got some information I think the Office of Special Investigation would need to know. Okay, and I'm willing to turn over the evidence. And so he called up to the uh, someplace up on the base and uh, said, okay, well, there will be an office uh, – Officer from Special Investigation will come down and talk to you. Park in the parking lot over here. And so I parked in the parking lot, and here comes this uh, officer that works in the Office of Special Investigation from the Air Force down, Air Force in a truck. He comes down, he pulls through the guard track, and he and the guard walk over to me in the visitor parking lot, and he said, I'm Officer so-and-so, and how can I help you? Really nice guy. Um and I said, well, I'm doing an investigation, and I've got some information the Air Force needs to know. And uh, he said, well, do you have any references? And, uh, and I said, yeah, the FBI. <laughs> 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 because they are my reference. I've been there, there three times, okay? Right. I'm, I'm using it as a reference. So anyway, so uh, he said, okay, come back tomorrow, check in, and Somebody will talk to you. So I came back the next day, checked in at the guard shack, parked in the visitor parking lot. Here comes the same guy down. But all of a sudden, he pulls through the guard shack, picks up the guard. They come out in the visitor parking lot, pull up behind me about 20 feet, 25, 30 feet off to my back, left side, driver's side. Mm -hmm. And he gets out with an M16, cocked and loaded and walks up to me with the other security guard, and it says, uh, you need to leave the base immediately. Cool. And I said, what's up? I said, well, they don't want to talk to you right now. The Air Force does not want to talk to you right now. And you need to leave the base immediately. And I guess if I didn't, I'd need to be shot or arrested or something because he was threatening me with an M-16. So which one of these okay. entities, in your opinion— uh, and it sounded like the FBI, but which entity, whether it be military branch or, or government facility, has been the most cooperative? The FBI. Okay. So have they been giving you information or have they just been taking your information? I've been giving them information. Okay. So fearfully, because he, here's, um, a, you know, that, what, that there's that guy, Richard Doty. You familiar with that name? Yeah. 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 So that guy, I, I still have yet to track him down. I need to. Um, how many people out there operate at his level where they're putting intentionally putting misinformation into the public in order to confuse reports, sightings, and, and data? I imagine numbers big. Yeah, well, you know, we had a UFO flap down here in Houston, and uh, 
it was over uh, Texas City, which is a suburb south of Houston. There's a big lake down there called Moses Lake. And anyway, they got on channel ABC, I think it was. I don't remember which channel it was. And the head of Homeland Security for Texas City got on the TV and said, uh, we're having a UFO uh, sightings down here. If anybody knows anything about this, would you please report to the uh, Texas City Police Department and ask for Homeland Security? So I jump in my car. <laughs> so I drive down to Texas City, walk into the Texas City Police Department up to the guy, and I said, I'm here to talk to the Homeland Security guy. And he says, okay, I'll call him. So here he comes out. We go back in the back in the bomb shelter of the Texas City Police Department. And he sits down. He says, well, what do you know about these UFOs? And I said, I know it's a cover-up. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I also told him, I know how you can report a UFO to Bigelow Aerospace. Because Bigelow Aerospace is running a UFO investigation. And they just gave Bufon $500,000 and created their star teams, and they'll take your report, a big low aerospace. Boy, he went off on me. He jumped straight up out of that chair and says, I don't report to no aerospace companies. I report to Homeland <laughs> Security in Washington only about these UFOs. Yeah, and, and I unfortunately, got kicked out of the police department. He threw me out of the police department. Yeah, when you report to, to, to when you when you report to NSA is not the same as reporting to, to Bigelow Aerospace because NSA is going to take the information and seal it. Where Air, Bigelow Aerospace, they'll evaluate it and then they'll make public notes of it. There's a big difference. I mean, Bigelow, Big, Bigelow, who's a billionaire, who's got a big NASA contract over here, who's one of the top UFO investigators in the world who works for NASA, uh, said on TV, 60 minutes of one of those deals. Yeah, aliens are real. They're living right underneath our nose. Yeah, and the hard part of that is it, it, a lot of that has to do with our perception, especially today. Everyone's so preoccupied today. They're in their phones. They're in their tablets. They're they, walking around with their cell phones, and the, the only thing they're able to perceive is what's coming through the cell phone. Right, okay? and you can't disturb their 360, meaning their surroundings. They, they can't be bothered. I mean, there could be a UFO hovering right over their head, and they would never see it. Agreed. So that being said, um, it's people like you and other investigators who you know, a lot of burdens put placed upon your shoulders for this information. Because again, although our military is releasing the information they're releasing, it's not the whole fact. It, it's it's these awesome videos that that were leaked or, or released in 2017 were great videos, but that's got to be a small percentage of what they actually have collected. A very it's small. The tip, it's the tip of the iceberg. Right. The very tip of the iceberg. I predict in the next decade we're going to know more. I'll tell you why. And I, and I say this and I repeat it a lot. Private industry is going to space now. And it's no longer about um, helping NASA. This is a uh, it's an ego thing, right? There's billionaires like, well, I could go there. I'm going to do tours on the moon. You got the uh, Jeff Bezos talking about putting celebrities in space. He's doing it. Eventually, we're going to come to... Here's hopefully it doesn't happen, but eventually one of these billionaires will will take note of the 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 UFO and the new dare is going to get close to it for information and there's going to be an incident in space involving celebrity people. And well, there may be a, there may be an incident right here in the near future because we've made the full circle on the nuclear thing right. and we've got Russia now threatening to use nukes and if we get into a nuclear war. Like back in October 1973, we were getting ready to get into a nuclear war. All of a sudden, these UFOs could very well start showing up again at our military bases, shutting off our nuclear weapons, and we're going to set jet fighters up to try to bring them down, and they're just going to buzz away, man. Yeah, I mean, and a they, lot they, of people are going to see them, and it's going to be a lot of questions asked. They would because, kind of have to, Kenneth, because they consider this if we annihilate one another, their studies done, their entertainment's done, their science projects done. They people need to understand it's not about love. They, I don't. I, I really don't believe a higher intelligence is going to love us. We're we're a study. We're 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 a form of. We're uh, actually a threat. I think humans are a threat, and why I say that is, is these UFOs have been around for a long time. Right. They've been coming and going. Uh, 
well, like the guy for Bigelow Aerospace, uh, the head dude, one of the other head dudes. He says, we are a way station in space. And if we are a way station in space, aliens could be coming and going from this planet for thousands and thousands right. of years. Which is why I think, and if you look at like the, uh, I'm under the impression there's been more than one apocalyptic thing on this planet that has started uh, life here over and over again. And I, I would imagine when we become a threat to, to a higher intelligence that's not of here, when we get to that point where we're, where we're actually a viable threat to them. Well, we I, are. I, I because think, that's what the guy that made the atom bomb said. Right. The I, guy I think, that made the atom bomb and tested the first atom bomb said, we have now become the destroyer of worlds. Right. So at set point, I think they shut us down because they, they've they proven they could shut our technology down. They have, now I'm predicting. I'm predicting right now that if we get into a nuclear a confrontation with Russia that there's going to be another major worldwide UFO wave and everybody's going to start seeing these things and they start calling the police departments, the FBI, the yeah. Army, Navy, Air Force, and everybody else want to know what's going on here. Yeah, I think in the 70s you said we got to get DEFCON 3. Now, if we get to DEFCON 2 or 1 here currently, I think it's not, I think it's that point. I think the the ability to, to witness them and what they would do would be even more heightened. I think it would be. Well, I think it's already, they already know what they will do because wise, the, uh, the famous uh, movie dude wise from the day the earth stood still. Yeah. Um, he was in world war two. He was a, uh, educational filmmaker for the military during world war two. And as soon as World War II was over, he came out and he made the earth stood still. And he was an ex-military guy, okay? So what I think was going on, because you see early days of UFO, uh, UFO ufology, um, there was a lot of people that wanted the people to know what was going on. And there was like a power struggle within the military industrial complex. Right. Uh, to shut the whole thing down, make a joke out of it, and not let the people know what's going on. And that's sure. what's been going on for the last 50 years or so. But in the early days, because NICAP, one of the very earliest UFO groups, was head, headed by the ex-top military dudes in the United States from World War II. <laughs> yeah. So once, once they decided... And I think the CIA is the one that did it. Uh, the CIA decided to take over everything, shut the whole operation down, start disinformation campaign with all the UFO groups and UFO people to make them all a joke so that they could make the people believe that this is not real, there's nothing going on. So th you got to realize, pay Operation Paperclip, we brought – the Nazis over here from Germany right after World War II. Right. For okay, and they flew program. them into White Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Okay. I debriefed the guy that flew him in. And the guy that flew him in told me, he said, when we brought these Nazis into the United States from Germany, they were like our best friends. And we flew them into what? Right Patterson. Now, these guys are some of the nastiest people you've ever seen. They killed hundreds of thousands of people millions, okay, for, millions for no reason at all. And, and, and now we've got this, the German technology and these guys were already involved in the UFO world because supposedly in 38, a UFO crashed in the black forest in Germany and the Nazis were on that right away. And they were trying to reverse the alien technology. Okay. So now we got them at Wright-Patterson at the Air Force Base. So now they're working for us, okay? But here's the problem. Yeah, they, they helped us with the nukes. They helped us with the missiles. Our they Apollo program. Yeah, and NASA. They helped NASA. They create, right. practically, practically created NASA. Right. So here And so here's where the problem comes in. They brought their Nazi propaganda machine along with them. And the CIA took their Nazi propaganda machine and use that to put out disinformation, 
to keep the public completely out of the loop, the Congress completely out of the loop, and the president completely out of the loop. And so we've got some elite group of intelligence people that's really in control of this whole thing. Okay, and that's where the black helicopters come in with no markings. That's when people get called up and said, if you say anything, like, we're going to kill you. Okay, that's where all this Nazi stuff comes in from. And they're using it, the propaganda, to cover up the whole UFO thing, just like the Nazis used to cover up the killing of the Jews in World War II with the German people. You know, there's also now we're using it on the American people. There's also another very powerful, very wealthy empire on this planet that it's in their better interest to suppress the knowledge of, of life elsewhere in ufology, and that would be the Vatican. They want... Oh, yeah, the Catholic Church, yeah, they, they've got... Supposedly they've got... They already know, okay? Right. But you're not, if you're the Pope, you're not going to get up and tell all the people, yeah, we've known about these aliens for... Because you know, consi- consider and- <laughs> their you know consider their uh, their education. Their education's uh, predicated from the Bible, and according to the Bible, God made here, and it was done in seven or he, six days, and he rested on the seventh. And yeah. so, as far well, as the Bible in the UFO world, there are UFO people that study the Bible and say the Bible is full, full of UFO stories, full of them, I, I, and. <laughs> I don't. So I'm not I, a, I can't I've doubt read on the it. Bible, but it was a long time ago, mm-hmm. and and the Bible to me is like a history book. It you know it's some some of it's going to be right. I'm not one of these people who says the Bible is exactly right, but there's certain things in there that could be right, and you have to put the whole puzzle together. You have to connect all the dots and everything. Right. I think, so, but a, a good portion of the Bible was mankind. So if I tell Kenneth, hey Kenneth. I just threw a rock and hit that car. In 10,000 years from now, I threw the rock, it hit the car, the car exploded and blew up the building behind it because that's what humans do. We take a piece of, of fact and we fictionalize it to make it more incredible. Well, not as only time that, goes. but when, you, when, you, when you're transferring information uh, from one person to the next, and I tell you uh, what I, my report, then you go tell somebody else my report, Report. They tell somebody else my report. They tell somebody else my report. You know how diluted that report is by yeah. the time it gets down to about the tenth or twentieth person. Yeah, it, it's how a, right it's, it is. What it, I really said. It's a full blown Hollywood movie by the end of the by the end of the chain. You know, it's so, like you know, look at China. You know, and Ch- China we even have UFO people, uh, UFO people that really believe. This no, I'm not kidding. Really believe Jesus was an alien, and I'm not kidding. You know, I mean, for a guy who had such positive speech, and if, if you really look at what Jesus did, or at least the way I look at it, you know, turning water into wine, making fish of many, a lot of these things are a, a combination of, uh, you know, science and alchemy and, and basic knowledge with a, with a positive message behind it. And once again, humanity takes a story and blows it out of proportion. Uh, and and that's, that's, a, that's a subject for another time, but... At the end of the day, if we're going to come to terms, if we're ever going to come to terms with the idea of there being an alien race that's superior, if we ever really fully believe we're going to have a communication with them ever, we here on Earth have one responsibility. We need to start behaving like a species and stop raising banners and flags and separate. Well, you know, that uh, the aliens, like you said, have been watching us, monitoring us for a long time. If they feel that humans are about ready to destroy Earth, their home, uh, we could be in deep shit. That's all I, I got. I, 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 I agree with you there because at the end of the day, they don't want their, their experiment being t- tainted. They're going to protect well, them at all costs. How about where they live? I mean, if you set off a thousand nuclear bombs, there's not going to be a whole lot left here. It's true. Okay? Yeah, it would, take, it would take millions of years for the planet to recover. Millions. And so... And they have turned off nuclear weapons before, and they've also activated nuclear weapons before in Russia. So yeah. I think what they're telling us is, is uh, don't fuck up if you really want to know the truth. I agree. Yeah, don't ruin our study or we will shut you down. Kenneth, yeah, before and, we close. And the military knows that, but the problem is humans are so... 
We're, we're, I hate to say it. We, Humans are stupid. Yeah. In my book, we're very self-absorbed. We're, uh, we're very we're, we're not far out of the Stone Age, and we might get sent back to the Stone Age. Well, unfortunately, our technology is evolving faster than us. Uh, no, and the people can't keep up with the technology. Right. The technology is way ahead of the That's people. Why we should, way, way, way we, ahead. We should really exercise caution with AI, because when you develop an AI and become sentient, it's going to recognize these people are self-absorbed. All they give a shit about is what they're wearing and who looks cooler, who is tougher, who's more popular. That's not very practical. There's nothing pragmatic about it. We should probably eradicate them. Because well, why, if why humans destroy are going to destroy Earth, uh, there could be a confrontation is all I'm saying. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Kenneth, before we close, is there, uh, is there anything you want to like uh, tell anyone and where they can find you or how, you know, if they want to get into a group or if there's any information you want to pass along, how would they contact well, right you? Right now, I'm just focused on I had to leave all the MUFON people behind. I had to leave all the national reporting people behind. I had to leave all the people to write books behind. And I had to go wherever I needed to go. So now I'm dealing with people like the FBI, Homeland Security, the Air Force, um, senators, congressmen, and all those kind of people. Because I ain't got time to argue with this stuff with everybody else. If you don't believe in aliens, great. I don't have a problem with it. Right. You know, I ain't got time to argue with you is all I got to say. Yeah, to each his own. Right. In any regard, so. Kenneth, it's been a pleasure talking to you. For those listening, we'll say good day, good evening, good night, whatever it is for you. And I'm going to talk to Kenneth in post.